Well, thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Hans. Um, I hope I get at least 10 out of 12 as far as marking is concerned. Um, and it's a pleasure again to thank Hans and Gulchin for their uh, wonderful hospitality. And I'm glad to see uh, many familiar faces here. And I'd also like to thank Jay, who uh, has been so helpful to us down the years, and also the hotel staff who've helped to make this conference one of the most pleasant uh, conferences uh, that I've ever attended anyway. Well, as advertised, uh, my subject this year is uh, political correctness in the medical journals. And it's easier to recognize uh, political correctness than to define it. Uh, and what's more, the matter with which it concerns itself uh, changes from time to time and quite suddenly uh, without any apparent central uh, directions. It's a bit like fashion. Uh, in the old days, I remember that hems, the hems used to go up and down, uh, uh, seemingly spontaneously. Uh, and perhaps the study, the correct study of uh, political correctness would be Balenciaga and Chanel, um, and uh, to find out uh, how, uh, how political correctness is uh, decreed. But at any rate, it is a manifestation, in my opinion, of a kind of dictatorial, uh, not to say totalitarian, ambition. And uh, I'm reminded of what the Marquis de Custine said about Tsar Nicholas I and his regime in his book, uh, Russia in 1839, a book, incidentally, uh, which was a wonderful guide, or is a wonderful guide, to 20th century totalitarianism, which was written eight decades before uh, th that totalitarianism came into existence. Well, Nicholas and his regime, wrote Custine, is both eagle and insect. Uh, they were, Nicholas and the regime, were eagle in the sense that they overflew society and surveyed it as a whole, and uh, they were insect in the sense that they insinuated themselves into the smallest crevices of life and surveyed everything from the bottom up as well as from the top down. And no one could ever be quite sure that he was uh, free of surveillance. Well, political correctness, or those who seek to impose it, is a little like that. On the one hand, uh, they want to reform society in a fundamental way, uh, and on the other hand, uh, they want to reform, or perhaps redeem is a better word, our individual souls by making sure not so much that we think correctly, but that we cannot think incorrectly. And language is therefore essential uh, to their project and ambitions. And even if the in the long run uh, they are thwarted in their ambitions, they will at in the meantime, at least have had the pleasure of exerting power and causing a great deal of discomfort uh, to people whom they uh, do not, uh, or they despise or hate or fear. And there is, after all, a lot of pleasure to be had from making people uncomfortable and miserable. Um, it's a great consolation uh, for someone's own mediocrity. Now, at first sight, medical journals might not seem a very propitious target uh, for political correctness. After all, if you go to the doctor with pneumonia, uh, the diagnosis and treatment is the same, uh, whatever the political or social opinions of the doctor. But a moment's reflection will show that this is far from the end of the story, that there is, in fact, a great deal of scope and material for political correctness in uh, medicine, which is actually a much vaster field than the simple interaction of a doctor uh, with his patient. Uh, there are all kinds of considerations that make it a happy hunting ground for the political correct, and nowhere is this more so uh, than in medical journals. Incidentally, I should profess, uh, preface my remarks by saying that I have no objection uh, to the publication of any particular point of view uh, much to the contrary. Uh, what I find distressing in the medical journals is the lack of any other point of view 
uh, that is expressed in them, as if the medical profession uh, were the Albanian electorate in the good old days of Enver Hoxha. Well, in fact, I'm going to refer only to the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, first, because it is uh, one of the two or three most eminent medical journals, general medical journals in the world, and secondly, uh, because it's fairly uh, typically in, uh, typical in this respect, and third, because I happen to have been writing a weekly commentary on it uh, for the last uh, several months, which uh, my wife says no one will be interested in publishing as a book, and she's probably right. And therefore, I've uh, taken a little of the material for this talk so that at least I haven't wasted my time entirely, at least in my opinion. I hope that will be your opinion too. But let me assure you that I could have derived uh, uh, the same material, uh, actually even more material, from The Lancet as from the New England Journal, and The Lancet is the, another uh, very important uh, medical journal. Indeed, I don't know of any publication in the world that is more full of unctuous, self-righteous, utterly predictable sentiment than The Lancet. Um, they, uh, they quote themselves on the front, they put the uh, quotes from themselves on the front cover. And uh, <clears throat> this is a, an enormous contrast with the Lancet of the 1820s and 30s and 40s when its founder, Thomas Wakeley, fearlessly exposed genuine, obvious abuses and evils with wit and passion and in... Uh, uh, combative and uncompromising prose that make most of us here seem very mealy-mouthed indeed. Uh, and, uh, of course, he was sued many times for libel. Uh, and it's a great pleasure uh, to read it now. Um, and one of the things you realise is just how much freedom we have lost by comparison with the 1820s and 30s, at least intellectuals have lost. Well, let me start with the insect end of the insect to eagle uh, spectrum. I take it from an interesting article in a very recent edition of the New England Journal. And here I want to make it cl uh, clear that I'm not claiming that the uh, journals contain nothing but political correctness. That would be a, a gross exaggeration. It would be absurd. Um, and there's much that is of value in them, after all, and there is medical progress in, in no small part uh, because of the publication of these journals. Uh, they also have other defects, uh, for example, uh, to a tendency to publish uh, uh, scientific reports which are clearly uh, um, tainted by commercial uh, corruption, but that's another matter. Well, the article to which I uh, have referred concerns the effect of a follicle-stimulating hormone, uh, FSH, it's a pituitary hormone, uh, on obesity. And in this case, a mice, uh, uh, it was uh, the effect of obesity in mice. Um, now, of course, uh, what happens to mice uh, doesn't necessarily happen in man. I remember... Uh, a lecture in which I attend by a very eminent physiologist uh, who was describing the biochemistry of uh, rat brains and uh, somebody said, uh, well, that's very interesting, Dr. Smith, but after all, man is not a rat. And the doctor on my right said, oh, yes, he is. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was deeply heartfelt that, anyway. Um, anyway, the experiments with mice showed that if mice with access to, in effect, an infinite supply of food were treated with a substance that blocked the effects of FSH, they did not grow fat uh, as those did that were not treated with, uh, with this substance. So it seems that uh, though you can't have your cake and eat it, as the old... English Proverbs ha says, one day we will soon be able to have our cake and not grow fat, which of course is much more desirable. Now, where is the political correctness in all this, uh, you might ask? Well, it was hidden in some wording. Uh, 
and I'll read it to you. <coughs> Three-month-old intact fe female and male mice were treated for eight weeks with intraperitoneal injections of FSH antibody. Or again, the FSH treatment resulted in significant decreases in fat mass in female and male mice. Now, anyone with an ear for English, for the English language, which admittedly, in my experience, excludes most sub-editors in both British and American publications, who are chosen exclusively uh, for their indifference to the euphony of language. Anyhow, I say, um, anyone with an ear for the English language knows that the natural locution is male and female mice, and not female and male mice. And this is for reasons of language, and not because anyone seriously supposes that male mice are more important or better than female mice, uh, and therefore ought to be mentioned first, or we are trying to impose a patriarchal order <laughs> on, on laboratory mice. <laughs> And in fact, if we were talking about uh, uh, their gonads, we would say uh, ovaries and testes, testes, not testes and ovary, for the same reason. The order is worth changing only if you think that the expression of male and female mice is in some convoluted uh, sense derogatory uh, to women. This is a very small thing in an otherwise interesting and unexceptionable article, but it's the very smallness of the thing uh, in which its significance lies. For it suggests that someone, whether the authors themselves or quite possibly the sub-editors of the journal, have bothered to think about it. And this in itself suggests a kind of determination or even fanaticism that the minds or souls of readers of the journal must be reformed or cleansed of the wrong ways of expressing themselves. And of course, this thing, kind of thing goes by default. It's insidious because no one can be bothered to oppose it. Uh, and if you did try to oppose it, you would be thought of as a bad uh, person, misogynist or something like that. And what applies, incidentally, to the uh, New England Journal applies to practically all uh, American university presses, uh, which increasingly seem to uh, force a language code on their authors, um, which sometimes is quite convoluted. And even on those who, be just because of their age, could not possibly have used that language themselves. So it's it's forced upon them. Well, let me now mention something at the other end of the scale, the eagle end of the scale. Uh, when I uh, uh, started my project, that my wife thinks probably correctly is utterly futile, um, because no one will want to publish it, I straight away came across uh, an article about uh, the current uh, cholera epidemic in Haiti. And this was interesting because while Haiti has never been a very healthy country, rather the reverse, indeed it's the unhealthiest country in all the Americas, uh, cholera uh, had never been seen there until the year 2010. And in a way, anyone who has been to Port-au-Prince would, would actually find this uh, rather surprising. But nevertheless, it is so. There was no cholera in Haiti. In the article in the uh, New England Journal about the Haiti epidemic, there is a more subtle form of political correctness. That is to say, political correctness by omission. The second paragraph of an otherwise excellent article, it's a good article, was almost as interesting for what it did not say as for what it did say. Uh, the first sentence of the paragraph to which I refer reads as, po as follows. Cholera had not been recorded in Haiti until it was introduced in 2010. Uh, we then learn that the epidemic has caused 800,000 cases 
Uh, that is to say, about, in about 8 or 9 percent of the population, with 10,000 deaths. Uh, and a death rate, incidentally, of uh, 1 in 80 cases demonstrates that even in Haiti, modern medical care has a long reach and beneficial effect because the death rate uh, of cholera, when first introduced into Western countries in the 19th century, was probably about 50 percent. So while we always lament the state of the world, uh, progress, however, however uneven, uh, does actually sometimes happen. Now, there's a fairly obvious question uh, that you might have thought would be worth a at least a glancing um, reference in the, uh, in the, in the uh, article. By what or by whom? was cholera introduced in Haiti in 2010. And on this question, the article uh, is completely silent, as if it were an indelicate one to ask, rather like who is your father of a child in a British slum. Uh, but for a medical audience, the question of the means of introduction of cholera into Haiti is at least one of passing interest. And we have long su superseded the kind of explanation that it was just the, concurrent, uh, the confluence of the Moon and Jupiter or Saturn or some such uh, that, uh, that did it. In fact, it is virtually certain that it was Nepali peacekeeping troops of the unfortunately named United Nations Mission for the Stabilization of Haiti that introduced uh, cholera into the country. When they left uh, Nip uh, Nepal, uh, there was a cholera epidemic uh, raging there. And when they arrived in Haiti, the sanitary arrangements of their camp on the banks of the largest river in Haiti, from which a very large proportion of the population draws its water, uh, were very primitive, and they discharged their waste directly into that water, which was the drinking water of the population. There's no reasonable doubt about this now. And in fact, there was no reasonable doubt about it for quite a long time. But interestingly, there has been uh, what I hesitate to call a conspiracy of silence about it in the major, uh, major institutions of the world about it. And I hesitate to use the word conspiracy because as soon as you do, people ask you whether you've stopped taking your pills lately. Um, anyhow, uh, the United Nations, the World Health Organization and the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta long refused to entertain, at least in public, or to consider and propound what was, uh, after all, a fairly obvious and cogent possibility, which turned out to be, of course, the truth. In what can only be called the cover-up, they were ably assisted both by the New England Journal and the Lancet, um, both by means of commission and omission. They published theories which were clearly not as cogent and they refused to publish uh, 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 the theory that turned out to be correct. And they refused for a very long time. And the theory was finally uh, proved more or less to everyone's satisfaction by the doggedness of a lone uh, French bacteriologist and epidemiologist from Marseille who was nevertheless obliged to publish his researches in much more obscure publications which entered medical consciousness much more slowly. And furthermore, they published obviously flawed papers that offered alternative but very unlikely explanations. Well, one can only speculate about the reasons for this conduct. Um, fear of provoking unrest in the Haitian population, which had already uh, suspected this connection itself, uh, that would be directed at peacekeepers might be one explanation, but it's also possible uh, that it was to preserve a, a, a world view in which intention is always more important than result. Uh, no one 
uh, not at, at least on this side of psychosis, at least I think I am on this side of psychosis, suggests that cholera was introduced deliberately into Haiti, though uh, gross negligence was clearly uh, involved. But the intention of the peacekeeping force, apart from providing Nepal with some much needed foreign exchange, was of course the keeping of the peace. And who can be against the keeping of the peace? But cholera epidemics give peacekeeping a bad name. And uh, no one but a monster would not wish uh, peacekeeping efforts to continue and therefore one must be silent about where the cholera uh, came from. To my knowledge, no acknowledgement of error, let alone of culpability, has ever appeared in the New England Journal or the Lancet. Well, it's very rarely that an issue goes by, uh, the New England Journal is a weekly, by the way, as is the Lancet, without some manifestation or other of political correctness. And again, I don't mind this. I don't mind if people um, have opinions which I think are absurd. Um, but uh, there is very rarely any uh, opposition to it or any publication of anybody arguing against it. One senses immediately what is politically correct by one's instinctive knowledge that no other view will be allowed to appear in the publication. Uh, and it is as likely that a politically incorrect article, or should I say merely a non-correct article, um, and incidentally I don't believe that what is correct is necessarily the diametric opposite of the politically correct. Uh, no, it is as likely that the New England Journal would publish uh, such an article as that uh, Pravda would have published translations of the articles of Frederic Bastia. <laughs> well, I confess that my own examination of the political correctness in the New England Journal is not scientific. I have not, for example, uh, developed a typology of its forms or analyzed it by its subject matter. I've simply taken it as it comes, uh, week by week, and I now have, I ask you to believe this, an extensive dossier on the uh, subject. A recent example, another recent example, is an article by the director and her deputy of the National Institute on Drug Abuse with the title, The Role of Science in Addressing the Opioid Crisis. The authors begin uh, uh, with what is a kind of cross between a politically correct statement and a magical incantation. Opioid addiction is a chronic relapsing illness. Uh, now, when you come to think of it, there's a considerable element of magical thinking in political correctness. If you change the way people speak about reality, you will not only change that reality, and language being so important to human existence, the way we speak actually will change reality in certain respects, but change it in precisely and only the way uh, in, that we want. Anyway. The idea that opioid addiction is a chronic relapsing illness in the sense of, say, multiple sclerosis is a chronic relapsing illness is now a form of medical correctness that has passed into the sphere of political correctness. It's an unchallengeable truth. Uh, to the extent that you never find anything uh, that goes against that opinion. Uh, and to do so, is to lose or to put yourself on the mar uh, margins of moral, scientific, and professional uh, respectability. And yet, it's obvious rubbish. Um, and you, but you can't uh, engage in any public discussion of the matter, at least in any important medical forum. The authors say, among many other things, in the past few decades, we have, uh, we have made remarkable strides in un our understanding of the biologic mechanisms that underline pain and addiction. And, strictly speaking, that might be so. 
But what the article rather omits to mention is that their institute has presided while it has spent $20 billion of taxpayers' money, uh, soon as the American senator once said, we'll be talking real money. Um, they have presided over what is probably the largest mass poisoning uh, in American history, uh, namely the current mass poisoning by opioids, which bring about uh, more than 30,000 deaths in the United States a year, as well as uh, the addiction of two or three uh, million uh, people. And I should point out that the United States has lost uh, more than twice as many people to opioid overdose uh, since the year 2000, as it has lost in all its military actions since the end of the Second World War put together. Now, apparently, we understand the biological uh, mechanisms extremely well. Uh, but I doubt that the irony of this understanding going along with what is a really a very serious public health problem, um, the irony of it will ever make its way into the pages of the New England Journal. In the week uh, following the edition in which that, uh, the article about cholera appeared, there was an article about online review of doctors titled Transparency and Trust, Online Patient Reviews of Physicians. We read an impeccably bureaucratic type of prose that anyone who has worked in a modern organization, public or private, will at once recognize. Patient reviews offer clinicians valuable performance feedback for learning and improving both individually and across a system. Receptivity to performance feedback, which depends heavily on physicians' acceptance of the data's validity, facilitates a culture of continuous learning and patient-centeredness. Now, I mean, we get all this build. I mean, I, I, um, I used to uh, uh, measure my... Uh, my uh, circulars in inches uh, daily. Um, and this is the kind of stuff we had day in, day out. Now, what follows is a completely unnuanced encomium to such performance feedback as it's presently uh, conducted, overlooking entirely, entirely the possible drawbacks. Bear in mind that they've said we must accept the validity of what is said. Now, of course, uh, transparency and trust are good and desirable uh, things. Whether they're entirely compatible is another question, but I leave that aside. Note that in this passage, the wish is mistaken for the deed. Receptivity to performance feedback facilitates a culture of continuous learning, etc. Not might lead to, or at its best could lead to, but simply and boldly that it does lead to, though no evidence whatsoever is offered of this uh, supposed fact. Now, Dr. Shipman, who was a British family doctor who is thought to have murdered 200 of his patients, was very highly regarded by his patients. And if... Uh, <laughs> at the time uh, of his activities, I'll call them that, um, the kind of trip advisor performance feedback had existed, uh, they, uh, um, he, they would, the people would have said, well, he's, a, he's got a very good bedside manner. And he's always willing to listen. Uh, and here I must tell you that while I was in Manchester a little while ago, I bought in a second-hand bookshop, a small second-hand bookshop, a slim volume that Dr. Shipman had been asked by a medical uh, journal to review. And he, at this time, he was nearly the, at the end of his murderous career. And he had reviewed it. And the book was titled, Understanding the New Complaints Procedure in the National Health Service. <laughs> And um, in the foreword to the book, the chief medical officer, which is Britain's uh, equivalent of the American Surgeon General, um, 
the, the, the chief medical officer wrote, we have now learned how to weed out underperforming doctors. <laughs> so it makes you wonder rather what kind of performance he was hoping for. <laughs> Anyhow, in, a, in an example given of transparency and trust in the article were patients' reviews of a surgeon two favorable and one unfavorable. And the latter said, she did not seem as concerned with my illness as I was. <laughs> <laughs> now, well, of course, uh, when I go to my doctor with, say, uh, possible symptoms of cancer, I don't want him to be as concerned with them <laughs> as I. I want him to take a dispassionate view of them and uh, possibly to cure me. But many of the readers of the above review might think that it is an important and significant uh, criticism of the surgeon, especially as we live in deeply sentimental uh, times. Now, I'm not going to um, uh, deal with the other possible objections to this, uh, to this approach. But what is important is that once high-sounding words are introduced, thought seems to cease. And as I have said, the wish is taken for the deed or the fact, and no discussion ensues, or more importantly, is allowed to ensue. Other, uh, among other things, political correctness, including that in the medical journals, is a desire that life should be both simple and perfect, and without ambiguity. It's impatience with complexity. And in a world uh, denuded of religious belief, it is the replacement of virtue as conduct by uh, virtue as correctness of opinion and the utterance of the correct words. And we live in a culture in which uh, the warning of the Earl of Kent to King Lear before he makes his disastrous uh, decision, uh, these words have been forgotten or their significance. Nor are they empty-hearted whose low sound reverbs no hollowness. In other words, people who utter uh, sentiments are not necessarily the people who feel the sentiments uh, most deeply. But in the medical journals, I'm afraid there is a lot of reverberation of hollowness. Thank you very much. <laughs>